in this session as well um, from Tom Giddings, who is a hoverfly expert uh, and is going to talk to us about the hoverflies that burn. So over to you, Tom. Thank you, Brian, and thank, thank you, Anya, for inviting me to talk here. Um, so this, this, this uh, slide, the, uh, the landscape in this slide is an image showing some of the key hoverfly habitats in the Burren. Um, so this, this slide shows uh, Coolbeach Lock, which is on the eastern side of the Burren National Park. And what you can see around Coolbeach Lock, you've got permanent wetland habitats. So uh, hoverflies in the Burren, really, the wetlands that are important for them are the permanent wetland ha habitats rather than the, the turlocks. And then in the background, you've got the limestone pavement and calcareous grass and the hazel scrub, which also has its own assemblage of, ho of ho hoverflies. So in this talk, I'm going to talk a bit about some research I've carried out of the hoverflies of the wetlands of the Burren. And then I'm going to talk about some of the distinctive species that occur in the, in the kind of more drier calcareous grass and then limestone pavement habitats. But first of all, I just want to look at the overall level of hoverfly recording in, in the Burren. So this map shows the number of hoverfly species recorded in tetrads across the Burren. This is based on a database I prepared for MPWS in 2020. Um, does, I, I realise it doesn't include the, the, the data from the, the surveys at Ballyogan Lock and Sleeve Karen, um, but it included all the data that was available up, up, up to then. Um, so what you can see from the slide is that all the tetrads with the high numbers of hoverfly species recorded are all on the eastern side of the, of the Burren area. Now, I've also shown on this slide sites where I've carried out malaise trapping, and I'll talk a bit more about my malaise trapping work later in the talk. So the yellow circles are, are, are the sites where I carried out malaise trapping. And you can see that nearly all the tetrads with high numbers of hoverfly species recorded are where, where I carried out malaise trapping. If I remove the data from the malaise trapping, nearly all of the, the, the dark red and brown squares with high hoverfly species numbers disappear. And the only, um, the, the, the only square remaining square. with high... Sorry, I'm, I'm standing too close to that. Um, the, the, only, the, only, uh, the only square of high numbers of hoverfly species recorded remaining is this one at, in, the, in the southern part of the, the area, which is Drumore Wood. So what this map shows is that overall, across the barrel, there's quite, been quite widespread hoverfly recordings. So you can see it's quite widespread scatter of records. But generally, there hasn't been much intensive survey effort in, in, many, in, in many areas. Um, all my malaise trapping work was on wetland sites. So in the kind of more kind of limestone pavement, calcareous grassland sites, there hasn't been intensive survey effort. So despite the kind of lack of lots of intensive survey effort, we, we, we do have a, a fairly uh, respectable total of hoverfly species recorded from the Greater Burren. So of, a, of the around 180 species of hoverfly in Ireland, around two thirds have been recorded in the Greater Burren area, which is quite a respectable total. Now in this slide, I've also, looked, I've also put some data in about habitat associations of the hoverfly fauna. This is based on the surf and net database prepared by Martin Spate and colleagues, which codes all European hoverflies by their habitat associations. And I've just drawn out some very broad habitat categories from that database. There's a lot more detail in the database. Um, so the, the Irish hoverfly fauna is mainly a forest and wetland fauna. Um, and you can see, not surprisingly, in the Burren, we've got a greater representation of the wetland fauna than the forest fauna. Quite a few of the forest hoverfly species are associated with over-mature trees, which is probably a limited resource in, in, in the Burren. Um, the wetland category includes areas of fen car. So I, I've also done a, a separate category there for open wetland species, which are species that are associated with things like Open, well, uh, reed beds, marsh, fen habitats. And you can see that the, the Greater Burren area, we've got about 80% 80, 80 of the Irish fauna of that habitat recorded in the Greater Burren. And then the final habitat that I've, category that I've included there is what I've called the limestone pavement complex. So that's the kind of classic <coughs> Burren habitat complex of limestone pavement, calcareous grasslands, and hazel scrub. And not surprisingly, nearly all the Irish species associated with that habitat complex have been recorded in the Greater Burren. So now I'm going to talk a bit about some research I carried out on the wetland hoverfly fauna of the Burren, which I carried out for the BioChange project, which is a large-scale research project 
funded by the EPA under the National Development Plan in the late 2000s. So for this project, I, I carried out surveys of, of wetland biodiversity using various groups of invertebrates as indicator groups. And I carried out these surveys using malaise traps. For anybody who doesn't know what a malaise trap is, that photograph shows you one. It's basically a tent-like structure that catches flying insects. And it's very effective at catching very large numbers of insects. And this photograph is taken at Loch Anor, which is a small wetland in the southern edge of the Greater Burren area. So in, the, in these surveys, I surveyed 31 sites in total. The surveys weren't restricted to the Burren, as you can see from the map. Um, of those 31 sites, 21 were small calcareous fens, which are the small red circles on the map. Four were large calcareous fens, which are large red circles. Um, and six were small non-calcareous fens, which are the pink circles. Um, and of the sites I surveyed, I think 14 were in the Greater Burren, as defined by the, the map that Brian prepared. Um, now, I have a lot of detailed data analysis from this, this project, which I'm not going to bore you with. Um, I could show you slides of ordinations and GRMs, but I'm not going to go into that. But just to show you a little bit of data analysis, which I hope won't be too, too boring. Um, <coughs> so one of the things I looked at was how the, Malay, how the number of ho hoverfly species and other invertebrate species I recorded was related to the catch volume of the malaise, trap, the ma malaise traps. And the reason why I looked at that is that Malay traps are very um, variable in their effectiveness. It really depends very, very much where you put the malaise trap. They put it in a sheltered location, where how it's, relate, how, it's, how it's positioned relative to flight lines. So there's a lot of kind of, kind of a, there's a bit of an art in putting in your malaise trap, which means that it's hard to know how representative they are between sites. So I wanted to find a way of standardizing the results between sites. And so this graph shows the malaise trap catch volume along the x-axis, and the number of wetland hoverfly species are recorded along the y-axis. And the open squares are the data for individual traps. And the pink squares are the, data, the combined data for each site, which were, I had three traps on each site. So what you can see is that it's quite a strong uh, correlation between the malaise trap. It's a, it's a logarithmic correlation, but quite a strong correlation between the, the, the catch volume and the number of species recorded. And the regression lines are very similar, whether you use the site data or the trap data. Um, so using malaise trap catch volume is a good way to, to look at, um, you can basically standardize your, your data by looking at the deviation of individual sites from the regression lines. Now I've circled three sites at the left hand side of the graph. These are three sites where I had very low catch volume. So you can see the catch volumes of those three sites were much lower than all the other sites. And they also were much lower than the individual the catch volumes in a lot of the individual traps in other sites. Um, and these three sites were all sites I surveyed, kind of, these were like the most high barren of my sites. So these are sites like, sites like Rinamona Lock, Coolridge Lock, which are small wetlands up in the limestone pavement, surrounded by large areas of limestone pavement. And my guess is what happened here is that there was a drought in 2006. I think the sites may have dried out in 2006. And when, when I surveyed them in 2007, there was just very little in insect biomass. Um, I, you know, I, I have a lot of experience in malaise trap it, trapping, and the, the, the amount of the catch there was very, very low compared to what, what I would have expected at those sites. Um, so I think that's something that would be interesting to look at in more detail is what the effect of drought is on those, uh, the, those isolated wetlands up in the Burren. Um, the next slide is, shows the same graph by adding some extra data points. So in the larger sites I surveyed, I, I, I had my standard sampling effort of three malaise traps. But then I included additional three malaise traps to sample a wider geographical area in the sites and also a wider range of habitat variation to see whether if you have a larger site, you, you get higher hoverfly biodiversity by having a larger area and, and more habitat variation. So on the graph, the red, the red squares are the data from the six traps for those sites, and they're connected to the data from the three traps by lines. So not surprisingly, when you have additional traps, you increase the number of hoverfly species you record. But the interesting thing is that the increase is simply what you would be predicted from the increase in the catch volume. So you can see the regression, the, the, the lines connecting the, 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 the sites are more or less parallel to the regression line. So what that's telling me is that basically the hoverfly, the hoverfly fauna in these sites is very well mixed. So by increasing the size of your site, you're not getting any additional species. It, the, the, the species are mixed throughout the site. We don't have localized pockets of different hoverfly species in different parts of the site. And this is, 
you know, I, I, I carried out a lot more detailed data analysis, which all kind of show this, the same kind of picture. Now, I have a lot of data of in, on individual hoverfly species from, from this, and I just thought I'd focus on one pair of species that was particularly interesting. So these two species, Melanogaster rose and Hatella, are two wetland hoverfly species. Um, you, the, the, the map on the right shows their Irish distribution. The yellow squares are where uh, Hotel has been recorded, and the pink squares are where Eros has been recorded, and the orange squares is where both species have been recorded. Um, so you can see Hotel is generally a much more widespread and common species in Ireland, and, and Eros has, has a much more restricted distribution. Now, if you look at the literature, you, you'll find Eros has been described as, as a species of acid fen, and Hotel has been described as a species of more calcareous and base rich fens. Um, but I found exactly the opposite. So in, in, my, in my calcareous fens, I had loads of arrows. I, had, I recorded them all in my calcareous fens, often quite high numbers, and virtually no hotella. So that cluster of, of pink squares kind of south of Galway, that's largely my records from the biochange project of, of Erosa. And then I, I recorded very few hotella in the, in the calcareous fens, but in the acid fens, I only recorded hotella and no Erosa. So that cluster of yellow squares to the west of Limerick are mainly my hotel records from, from the biochange project. So the, the, these results were, you know, the, this pattern was so kind of unusual that I had hoverfly experts questioning my identifications. <laughs> and I had to send them spe specimens of their rosa to prove that I got it right. They were, they were, to be fair, they're, they're the third melanogaster species that occurs in Europe that could potentially occur in Ireland. So they wanted to check that. Um, but yeah, no, they, they were rosa. So obviously there's something very different happening with the ecology of Erosa in Ireland compared to elsewhere in Europe. Interesting also at Pollardstown Fen, which you can see is the orange square over Newbridge, uh, where I've also done a lot of uh, hoverfly survey work. I've recorded both Erosa and Tertella, both in, both in good numbers. Uh, so Pollardstown Fen is another large calcareous fen. So... Um, as I said, I'm not going to go into the details of, of the results of you know, the, all my data analysis, but just some of the broad conclusions from my survey work. The main conclusion really was that the, there was no real effect of size or isolation on the, on the hoverfly fauna of these wetlands. So this slide, you can see the, the, sl the picture on the, um, on the left of the slide is Licknorn Fen, which is a small fen just outside Ennis, just I think on the edge of the Greater Burren area, only a couple of hectares in size and basically mainly just, reed bed, just, mainly just Phragmites reed bed, and surrounded by very intensive farmland and with no real kind of marginal buffer zone. And then the, the, the picture on the right shows Loch Una, which is a very large calcareous fen on the edge of the burren, with large areas of Cladium and Sheenus fen and, and other, and other habit, habitats. But the hoverfly fauna of both of them are basically the same. And, and there's no, there's no, there's no in, significantly high species richness in Loch Una compared to... to uh, Licknorn Fen. Um, and then the other thing is that while, while I found there was differences in the hoverfly fauna between the acid fens and the calcareous fens, within the calcareous fens there was no real kind of differences between them. And I had some calcareous fens like Licknorn Fen, which were largely Phragmites, others which were Cladium or Sheenus or various mixtures, but they all seem to have more or less the same hoverfly assemblage. So you just have one kind of broad hoverfly assemblage that occurs in more or less all these sites kind of regardless of the details of the habitat. So that's the wetland hoverflies. Now I'm just going to finish up by discussing some of the uh, speciality, what I call hoverfly specialities of the burren, and these are mainly species associated with the kind of calcareous grassland and, and, uh, and um, limestone pavement habitats. So let's take a bit of water. So this first slide shows three species, all of which have larvae that develop in ant nests. Um, the two species on the left, the Chrysotoxum festivum and Xanthrogamma citra fasciatum. I suppose they may be not real true speciality of the burren. They both have good populations in the burren, but have quite widespread distributions outside the burren. But I put them in because they're both large, colourful species that can be identified in the field, so you don't need to take specimens. So they can be recorded by... Uh, you, know, you know, good photographs, so they're, they're, they're species to look out for. In, by contrast, the, the species on the right, Microdon mutabilis, 
You can't identify the adults in the field. You can't identify the adults under a microscope. You have to find the larvae or the pupae. So um, the, the, the adults can't be separated. Microdon muta mutabilis and Microdon myrmicae are a species pair that were only separated in the early 2000s. They both develop in ant nests, but mutabilis develops in nests of Lassius platyphorax, I think, and myrmicae in a formica species. I've, not formica, a, a myrmica species. Um, but I, forget, I forget the one. Uh, mutabilis is associated with, with kind of dry grassland habitats and occurs in very large populations in the burren. Um, so the, the burren is really a, a hotspot of, it, of its distribution, not just in Ireland, maybe at a European scale. Myrmicae is a wetland species. I'm not aware of any actual records from the greater burren area. However, a student of John Breen found it in a wetland just the wrong side of the motorway, uh, just outside Ennis. So <laughs> if, you, if you tweak your boundary barn, you, you, can, you can get it in. So, uh, the next slide are uh, species that you would uh, not be able to identify in the field. These are all kind of small black hoverflies. Uh, Paragus constrictus is, is, is the only hoverfly that is a true you know, burren speciality in that it only occurs in the burren, doesn't occur anywhere else in Ireland. And in fact, does, I, I, as far as I know, it hasn't been recorded in Britain either. There's one of that select group of species that, that occurs in Ireland, but, but not in Britain. But within the burren, it can be very abundant in, in, on limestone pavement habitat. Kylosia ahenia is another species that's, that's uh, abundant in limestone pavement and habitat in, in the burren, but does occur elsewhere. And Kylosia silifarma is a species that is only, there's only four records from Ireland, one of which is from the burren, but we don't really know anything about its ecology in Ireland. But given the lack of recording effort over much of the burren, obviously that's the kind of species that if we went out and surveyed more intensively in the limestone pavement areas, maybe, maybe we would turn it up again. And then the third group of species here, two species here, these are quite different. So Xylota tardu is actually a wooden hoverfly, but the only Irish record is from the Drumore Wood. And it's associated with overmature stands of aspen trees. So the record from 1978, where it was found close to some aspen trees, I don't know what the current status of aspen is in Drumore Wood, but it certainly will be a species worth looking for again to find out if it's still present in Drumore Wood and be worth managing for if it, if it was present. Um, and then the final species there, Doris profuse. This is a hoverfly, which is probably the most charismatic of the burren hoverflies. Uh, it's also known by the English name of the phantom hoverfly, and that refers to the fact it's a very elusive species. So that was quite widespread in Europe. It's any, every site where it occurs, it tends to only be seen once and not seen again for many years. It's not a species where you can go to any particular site and say, I, I, if I go there at the right time, I'm going to find it. Um, and, and this species also is thought to be a species that develops in ant nests, uh, possibly um, Lassius fuliginosus, although I think the evidence for that is quite sketchy. Uh, and it's associated with a kind of mixture of woodland of scrub and grass and habitats. So these are the Irish records of Doris profuge. Um, it was first recorded in, in, in Ireland in, in the Burren in 1962 from the vicinity of Carron. So that's a purple circle on, on the map. And then, despite a lot of people looking for it, there are no further records for another almost 50 years until I um, found it um, during my biochange surveys. So I found it at five sites during my, my survey. So those are the pink circles. Mm -hmm. So going from north to south, they are Rinamona Lock, um, Ballyogan Lock, Lock and Nor, uh, um, Bally McLoon Lock, and Arduin Lock. So you can see three of the sites were in the Greater Burren area and two of the sites were outside the Greater Burren area. The grey circles on the map are the other calcareous sites I surveyed during the biochange project. So I recorded it in about 20% of the sites I surveyed, of the calcareous sites I surveyed. Now, the sites I, the sites I, I, only, I, I recorded by malaise trapping. And the sites where I recorded, only, I only recorded single specimens at each site. So I think it's a good chance it could have occurred at some of the other sites. I just didn't happen to get any of my malaise traps. So, what, so while this species thought of being a very rare species in Ireland, I, I think it's probably quite likely to be quite widespread in, in parts of Clare and South Galway. Certainly species to go out and look for. Although it seems to be... Malaise trapping seems to be an efficient, a good way of finding it, but it's a very, very labour-intensive way of doing it. You know, we have three malaise traps running for summer to get one specimen is a lot of work for anybody who's done malaise trapping. Um, so um, just to finish some acknowledgements um, for, for some of the data sources that I've used in this talk and, in, and the images. And I hope this talk has given you a bit of a flavour of the hoverfly fauna <coughs> of the Bowen. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Tom. And again, um, now this is the opportunity for any questions. Connor, um, can we get a microphone? Just a question about um, the hoverfly density in the burn, yeah. like um, of the percentage. Like you obviously had like a, a lot of malaise trapping, um, yeah. like percentage of hoverflies to other stuff that was kind of being sifted through. What kind of like pr abundance percentage did you notice, or right. anything like that in your survey? Um, I mean, basically, with malaise trapping, Jimmy, the, the catch volume is largely parasitic wasps and lots of kind of small diptera that I don't identify. <laughs> so, uh, um, and, and, yeah, and so the hoverflies will be a very minor component of the malaise traps. I mean, I was identifying other things like moths and spiders, some other groups of diptera. Um, is that thing I did? One other group? Anyway, but, but I mean, I, I had... You know, malaise traps are... Are, are, they're a very effective way of serving hoverflies, but you get a large bycatch of stuff you don't identify. If you're, if you're just using for hoverflies, you're going to get a large bycatch. Any other questions? Anything online? Or want lunch? <laughs> oh, no, well, your talk was so good, Tom. You <laughs> didn't need an expert. Even I understood those those graphs. Oh, They're brilliant. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. Okay. So thanks, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you. And <laughs>